You talked about religion. Mm. One of the things that you mentioned before in, in a, another interview is the most destructive thing that's taken place in the black community has been the religions that's always been introduced to us. <clears throat> that's a fact. Explain that. Well, oftentimes when we look at religion, they don't give us an opportunity to study the historicity of the place or the geographical locale from which the information derives. I oftentimes find that many of the religions that our people make subscriptions to, they was confronted with those religions in light of them being oppressed by the very people who presented the information to them. And when I ask people, when was the Islam introduced to us as a people, or when was the Christianity introduced to us as a people, or when was the Judaism introduced to us as a people, or just the books in general, we oftentimes find that it was introduced to us while being in a state of servitude. And when I ask, can you show me when it's introduced to our people, void of being in a state of servitude, it's moot. The opportunity to suggest to me otherwise is moot. When we ask, when we do a philological perusal, of these corpus, religious corpus, or these texts. And we ask, like if the Quran says that Allah gives you the, the book in this language, or Arabiya, it sounds great. But then when we undergo the philology of the corpus, we find that the contents of the book was written before the language evolved. So there's no Quranic Arabic, right? Before the Quran, there's the Quran first, and it's written in Syriac, and we even look up the words, and if we go into the etymology of these words, or we do a thorough philological perusal, we see that it was written in Karshuni, which means they didn't have all the letters to transmit the information in Arabic because it didn't evolve yet, so they borrowed other people's scripts or figures or characters in order to uh, transliterate the information, and in turn, we see that if we go into the Christian language, right, the, we'll see if we study the Peshitta, New Testament, written in Syrian, right, not written in the Greek that many people think the New Testament is originally written in. We see that Christians called on Allah first before Muslims called on Allah. His name is in there several times. The Christians worshiped Allah before Muslims were even spoken of. And in fact, there's no documentation of a Muslim until hundreds of years after Prophet Muhammad's death. We don't see no documentation or acknowledgement about Prophet Muhammad's life until 200 years after his death. Doesn't mean that he didn't exist. It just means if I try to sell you a story that exists 200 years thereafter, you would think it's suspect. But with religion, we pacify that. We'll be also told that Prophet Muhammad was illiterate. But the Most High gave him a scripture. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would grant this man a scripture. His angel Gabriel would come and tell him to ikra or to read in the name of his sustainer. But he's illiterate. But then we look up the word for illiterate and we see the word umi there. And we see that it's a homophone. So we know that this is a word that has twofold meaning but it pronounced the same way. And the word umi means unlettered or unlearned in a scriptural language. So it doesn't necessarily mean he was illiterate, it just means he couldn't understand the language in which the information was presented to him, presuming that he even existed in the first place. But reading and comprehension is lacking in religion, and it's not strictly enforced to learn the language that these religions have their inception in. Mm. And thus, I believe that is the mechanism for being able to control people. And if they go for it, then you know you got them. So now you got a whole bunch of people saying that an illiterate man was endowed with something to read and convince everybody else to read it. Only religion could create that kind of ideology. Also, I've traveled the world to go to the places that's spoken about. And you go on my Instagram, you go on my Facebook. I've, I've went to King David's temple. And then upstairs is where they say that Jesus had his last supper. And then you go a few blocks down and you say, okay, what else is going on here? You find the place where they say God laid the first stone to create the planet Earth. Jesus was by the Mount of Olives and he looked over there. Talking about Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Yeah. I've been to yeah, Jerusalem. I've been there too. And I stood in the space where they said God created the world, 
which right. is also next to this the Dome a, of the Rock. Yeah, that's the Dome. Well, it's, 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 it's in the Dome of the Rock, right? It's inside. Yeah, inside the, the Dome temple, of the Rock. Yeah. Which is, you know, is like this close to each other. Right. Literally, God created the world here and Prophet Muhammad ascended there. The Mount of Olives is over there yeah. where Jesus cried that the temple would be destroyed. And after a while, I've also been to where Moses was found by the well, which is literally a few feet away from where Mary was hidden in a cave inside of a church. Both of them are named, both of them were babies. Both of them have someone named Mary that saved their life. Jesus was tempted after fasting for 40 days, 40 nights. Moses uh, went through the wilderness for 40 days, 40 nights. They both were in holes. That's called typology. And it's a very uh, popular writing style during that time to extrapolate data from Old Testament and leverage it into New Testament uh, theory or analysis to, to kind of reinforce the older conviction about God. But if we're not educated in how to approach the reading, then we think all these people existed. And maybe they did. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know that, that's, the thing, that, that, that's the thing that about Israel and Jerusalem that I think that every person who is either Christian, Muslim, or um, uh, or Jewish <clears throat> should should go to because what you realize when you go to this place and you start to get the tours and people start to show you around you realize that these are actually history books That's that fact. that people you know take religion out of them but when you take a step back you realize that a lot of this stuff actually happened, all the wars, certain people, That's and it fact. all happened within like 20 square miles. That's this a little fact. area, you know, you can see where the wars were, you can see like where, where like the Roman soldiers that set up their forts. You and, see the bullets on the walls. Yeah, the, yeah you know what I'm Facts. saying? That, that type of thing. And, and it's like, you know, it, it kind of puts everything in perspective for you because as you learn religion, you kind of feel like it's all make-believe and it's all like mystical and so forth. And, and you realize when you go to, you know, Jerusalem that... Oh, okay. There's a basis to all this. That's correct. And maybe someone embellished. Yeah, some yeah. Maybe someone embellished it, right? You know, you know. Maybe he didn't have 300 wives, but he may have had. That's a fact. Like, you know what I'm saying? And and these people, you see, like, you know, you could actually, it, it creates a connection. That yeah. that you know, the first time I went, because I've been there about three times now. You know, and for example, like, inside Jerusalem is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Which was built on, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Which was 14 built. 14 points that Christ went through. Exactly, in, yeah, yeah, exactly. Crucifix. And then, yeah, and then the church is built on top of the place where he was actually crucified. And his tomb is all right there. And it's all, right. it all kind of kind of starts fitting together, you know? And, and it, it creates a, a level of concreteness that I didn't have before. Yeah. It, it, you know, I like the narratives. It invokes a higher spirit and consciousness in man. What I don't like is the imposition of suggesting to people you should believe this, that, or the other, or you're stupid if you don't believe this. Like yeah. people tell me, uh, because of my perspective on God, because I don't believe in God, mm -hmm. I conceptualize that I should make my highest subscriptions to my ancestors, the ones most immediate to me that passed away, and they will be my medium to connect to the highest source. Now people may say the source is called God, and then there goes the semantics. So what I would say is my ancestors never confided in something called God. They confided in what's called nature. These are principles that are dissected into different facets of life. Hmm. And everything on planet Earth, including the Earth, is part of the conspiracy for that one consciousness. And people can call it God. I don't mind. But when I speak, I have to make sure I'm not rendering what my ancestors rendered as nature, as God, because they don't equate. They're just not the same thing. And with God comes the, the intimation that I may be speaking about the devil and the angels. I have to be careful about that. You feel me? Because I don't want no one to presume that I, I'm going along with the rhetoric that has been employed or, or employed for the purposes of diminishing our intelligence in the community. So I'm, I'm always clear that I'm talking about nature. I'm talking about uh, and what I mean by nature, the letter N as a prefix means agent, okay? And then chur, okay, means ancestor. So an agent of the ancestors. 